I'm sure everybody's already talking about it. Um, I haven't made it to the office today, but I was tipped off. I was told on a very personal day, which also happened to be Shabbos, about how in the morning on Pittsburgh, 11 Jewish people were killed, 23 injured. Uh, synagogue, I think they called it Tree of Life, I don't know. And already bourgeois liberals are calling for this as an opportunity to speak of gun control, when actually, no, quite the opposite, this is a time for Jewish people to start realizing that we need to start getting armed. Because how long will it take for the police to start attacking Jewish people? Right now, the police are afraid of being sued by Jewish people. And if you're black and Jewish, well, then then they probably don't even know you're Jewish because of their false beliefs in a Jewish race. But, you know, it, it's clear what's what's happening right here. I think that we need to keep reminding everybody that the concept of the right to bear arms is a left-wing position. You are not really supporting the left-wing, the left position, if you're for gun control. That in fact is much more of a right-wing position. Now in the last video that had been posted on this channel, I mentioned that you know, aside from the fact that actually the liberals and conservatives, that there are no liberals and conservatives, whatever, neo-lib, neo-con, whatever, the position would be that the conservative in America is right-wing and the liberal is centrist. However, I also had mentioned that now they're kind of both right-wing and the progressives are now the centrists. And it's kind of interesting that if you look at what separates now the fake neocon and the fake neolib, it isn't... I mean, they're both completely right-wing now. The neocon basically means be pro-life and um, worship guns and the military. And the neolib position would be disarm everybody except police and... Um, have a nanny state that is not a welfare state for the sake of uh, you belonging to super statism. Oh, and, and promote secular humanism over any other values. That's another thing. And sexual deviance is holy. That That's pretty much what those positions are. Oh, and we're going to pretend to love LGBT while we secretly hate them. That, that's another thing about the neolib. Let's not forget that. At least the neocon is open about their bigotry. That's one thing that is kind of nice about them. It's always more beneficial when a bigot is openly a bigot, as opposed to pretending to be your friend. Um, LGBT support for the Democrats is actually declining in the United States for good reason. And one of the reasons is that many of them want to be armed, as they should. And the Democratic Party platform doesn't really give that a voice. Let's not forget the, that uh, Ronald Reagan uh, was for gun control. He was Republican then when he was governor of California. It was about disarming black people. And keep in mind, we do believe in armed revolution, but what we believe in first, just as the Black Panthers had taken that position, uh, we believe that uh, armed resistance starts with deterrence. Nobody wants to hurt anybody. Um, however, it must be understood that the police are armed, and they brutalize citizens. That's what the police are for. The police are an occupation force to serve the, the bourgeois upper-class system. That is the whole purpose to the police. It is not to protect and serve you. It is to protect and serve the 1%. The 1% of anti-Jewish, by the way, bourgeois, usually Southern Baptist, usually, um, uh, British descent racist people that work on Wall Street. And yes, there is a German population of racists in the United States of America, 
However, I'm going to say something that I that that pretty much everybody else in our Bundist movement, by the way, is not going to agree with. In my experience, there are more racists among the American population that are British descent than German descent. You'll get more anti-racists among those that are of German descent. That's been my experience. Donald Trump is of German descent, so this does not go across the board. There's no way to generalize any of this. But I have actually seen how British people, or those of British descent, I should say, and those of the Anglo-Saxon superior-minded uh, uh, thinking, will attack those of people of German on mix, saying, well, that means you're a Nazi. Which is completely crap. Again, by the way, just in case that's brought up again, national socialism is not socialism, and anarcho- uh, capitalism is not anarchism. I think that that should be emphasized. Oh, and national anarchism is not all is, is also and national anarchism is also not anarchism. These are all reactionary concepts. But the Black Panther Party did speak for black people. Black people do still speak for themselves to an extent, I think, but I think black people have largely been neutralized in the United States. There, th This is actually, there's a pushback on this, and we need to support as much of the pushback as this as we can, especially because if we don't, black people won't support us. We have to be of mutual benefit, and that's to every group that is oppressed. And then we have to remember that there's still, there are, there are Jewish black people. There's no contradiction between a black the black nation and the Jewish nation, um, because... You can't be of two religions, but you could be of two nations in the sense that, well, what makes up the nation? Obviously, you can't be both Jewish and Hindu. That's not possible. But that's because that the Jewish nation and the Hindu nation are both based on culture and religion, not culture and ethnicity. And yes, there are Hindus that identify uh, uh, with the Hindu nation, which is not the same thing as India. India, again, it has many ethnic backgrounds, many religious backgrounds. It's a country, not a nation. And the Hindus are a nation, in the sense that they're a cultural, religious group, and there are definitely Hindus who identify as Hindu being a nation. By the way, Hindu nationalists don't really help that cause. In fact, Hindu nationalists are all about fusing the Hindu nation with a Hindu nation state, which is toxic and should be discouraged. What Hindus need to start thinking about is national cultural autonomy, as should black people. And I, I am giving the recognition that the more developed goes beyond Malcolm X and even the Black Panthers where they say we're black, we're not exactly African. I acknowledge those black people the most simply because they have a very strong point that they make. An African American, for instance, would be somebody from Africa that migrates to the United States, whereas black people are the descendant of slaves. So they're African in the sense of their genetic background, but culturally speaking, they are a different group. Also, there's many different African locations, and black people are a mix of several of them. This is known. We all know this to be the case. So, we have that. Now, I'm going to bring you to um, a video here. Alright, so this, uh, this next video uh, is from Al Jazeera. It was uh, published on November 7th, 2017. Uh, it's called The Racist History of Gun Control in the U.S. Explained. Gun control in the U.S. has racist past and present. In fact, most gun control laws throughout history were aimed at preventing black people getting their hands on guns. Here's how. As early as the 1600s, colonies in the states were passing laws that prohibited African Americans from possessing arms. But then the Second Amendment came along in 1791. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Many Americans interpreted this to mean that they, as individuals, had the right to carry guns. Meaning every individual right? Wrong. Having been emancipated after the Civil War, southern states passed laws known as Black Codes in 1865 and 1866. Among other things, those laws disarmed former slaves in order to sustain white control. In fact, African Americans were already at a disadvantage. They lost their right to vote in many states because of poll taxes and literacy tests. Exploiting many people's inabilities to read and write, states could further impose gun restrictions. Now fast forward a century to the 1960s. That's when the leaders of the civil rights movement made clear 
that the need for self-defence still existed. In fact, Martin Luther King Jr. applied for a permit to carry a weapon and was denied. In California, gun control legislation was aimed at preventing groups like the Black Panthers from arming themselves against police. In response, 30 armed Black Panthers marched on the state capitol to protest the legislation in 1967. Not long after, then-Governor Ronald Reagan signed the Mulford Act, prohibiting open carry of weapons in public places. The following year saw the Gun Control Act of 1968, signed by the then-President Richard Nixon. The law banned Saturday night specials, which were the cheaply made handguns associated with crime in minority groups, meaning black communities. Both of these laws were passed by Republicans and supported by the National Rifle Association, one of the most powerful anti-regulation gun lobbies in the USA. The organisation continues to advocate for gun owners, though many have criticised the NRA for failing to speak for armed African Americans. So today, why Americans are still more likely to own a gun, and while African Americans' gun ownership is on the rise, black men are 14 times more likely to be shot and killed than white men. So even though almost anyone can apply for a gun permit today, systematic racial bias in the US means that gun control remains a divisive issue. It is the position of the Jewish Bundist diaspora movement to never capitulate to our destruction. That is to not capitulate and to not concede to, to accept our destruction, be it from state power or domestic neo-Nazi thugs. All right, so this next clip that I'm about to play comes from the PBS NewsHour. It was published on uh, March 25th of 2018 this year. And the name of this film is In Response to Racist Violence, More African Americans Took to Bear Arms. This is a very, very good clip that I hope is taken rather seriously. Yesterday's march in Washington was just one more chapter in America's decades-long debate about guns, gun control, and the Second Amendment. But often underrepresented in that argument is a group of gun owners who believe they are a particular target of violence and need to defend themselves. News Hour Weekend Special Correspondent Simon Ostrovsky has our report. Hi, ready. Fire. This gun range is similar to others across America where firearms enthusiasts, proud and protective of their Second Amendment rights, can practice becoming a better shot. There you go. Whenever you're ready. How you like it? I like it a lot. <laughs> But this isn't a gathering of the National Rifle Association. Usually the clubs that I see is mostly Caucasians. Yeah. And so I, I saw this club, it was pretty unique, and so I gave it a shot. In August of 2017 is when I um, became a member of this chapter of the National African American Gun Association. We're with the Denver branch of the National African American Gun Association. Chapters like it are opening up all across the country because for an increasing number of people of color, the Trump era has been a call to arms. How ready? Fire. You know, some of the things that we were seeing in the news, a lot of the things that the president was saying and the reactions that we saw from a lot of members of the white community, not everyone, more white supremacists, it seemed like having some form of protection was, was a good thing for us to have. The incident in Charlottesville, when you had the white supremacists, you had the neo-Nazis and the uh, uh, white nationalists, and they came to that protest armed to the teeth. They had all types of weapons. And when a person got run over by one of their supporters, his answer was, well, there are good people on both sides. My theory is if you're march marching under the Confederate flag or you're marching under the Nazi flag, which America fought two wars to get rid of, you're not a good person. Fire. David Fannings is an Army veteran who believes the president's rhetoric has made the country less safe for minorities. He's saying what they have thought and felt for a long time, and him being the leader of the country, 
It's like giving them a green light. This is a 12 gauge shotgun. This one operates very much like an AR type rifle. For home defense, a shotgun is real good. To be able to be a member of an organization that was run by us, for us, that appealed to me. With just under 25,000 members, this gun group is tiny compared to the NRA, which claims around 5 million. But in the last 14 months, the National African American Gun Association, also known as NAG, has grown from just 14 chapters to 52. Based in Atlanta, the group's leadership doesn't sound so different from its NRA counterpart. The Second Amendment is an important right, just like any other right that we have. And it's one that our community has a complicated history with. But it's a right nonetheless that without that right, it's very hard to assume a position of a fully fledged citizen in these United States. But at NAG, exercising your Second Amendment rights isn't just a way to defend yourself and your family. It's seen as an extension of something much larger, the civil rights struggle. So some of the first gun control laws that came about in this country were related to race. They were related to keeping guns out of the hands of African-American people. To contain the misery and violence of the ghetto, Oakland's all-white police department earned a reputation for head-knocking brutality that has left a well-remembered legacy of bitterness in the minds and hearts of many who lived in that time and place. Back in the 1960s, some young African Americans in Oakland, California responded to police overreach by following the police and observing arrests. They called themselves the Black Panthers, and they were armed to the teeth, legally. Their armed patrols in an open carry protest at the state capitol alarmed the authorities so much that in 1967, the state instituted an open carry ban. Am I under arrest? Am I? Take your hands off me if I'm not under arrest. Ironically, it was signed into law by then governor Ronald Reagan. There is absolutely no reason why out on the street today a civilian should be carrying a loaded weapon. But as president, he strongly supported the NRA and vocally defended the Second Amendment, as does the current president. I am also proud to be the first sitting president to address the NRA leadership forum since our wonderful Ronald Reagan in 1983. I'd be lying to you if I said the political arena has not affected our membership. People look at what's going on politically and they see some of the comments that are made by certain folks in high places and it makes them a little unnerving and that has definitely been a part of our growth. While the new political climate is contributing to the interest in personal protection among African Americans, uh, reason I put you over to your brake lights are out. Part of the reason NAG members aren't flocking to the NRA is a policing culture that predates Trump. Sir, I have to tell you, I do have a okay. firearm okay. on me. Don't reach for it, then. Don't pull it out. Don't pull it out. The 2016 shooting of Philando Castile, a black gun owner with a concealed carry permit, outraged the African-American community. But in this instance, the nation's most established gun advocacy group didn't jump to publicly defend Castile's Second Amendment right. Oh, as far as the NRA is concerned, I'm going to lay it out there because I don't sugarcoat it. I'm going to give it to you in the raw. You take it any way you want to. But you didn't defend my son the way you would have defended a white person. They should have stood up for my son and, and gave him the due respect that they do anyone else that's killed in that manner. I used to be a member of the NRA, but I don't feel supported by the NRA uh, towards my needs in my community, so it's just, they're not there. Are you talking about incidents like Philando Castile? Yes. He announced that he does have a concealed carry and he was lawful and he got shot immediately. The NRA did not come forward and condemn the uh, deadly use of force on a person that was legally carrying. Anytime there was an issue with someone who looked like me or who I felt could be a part of my family, I don't believe the NRA had um, their back or had their best interest. Our oldest son is 27. He has a concealed weapon permit. He's allowed to carry. That worries me. 
because if he's pulled over, he's going to be treated differently. And he's often targeted and pulled over. You know, it has happened to him more times than I like to admit. The NRA did not agree to an interview with NewsHour Weekend. While African-American interest in personal protection appears to be rising, gun sales nationally are trending in the opposite direction. FBI figures show that background checks made by gun sellers dropped off during Trump's first year in office. The store in Aurora, Colorado, where the Denver chapter of NAG trains is no exception. For eight years when President Obama was in office, you know, gun sales were incredibly brisk. So probably, you know, 15 to 18 percent drop overall in business um, since President Trump's been elected. What do you attribute that to? I think basically nobody's really too concerned about any new gun legislation. So people are taking a big sigh and, you know, they figure that they can buy whatever they want fairly easily, um, certainly up until maybe the midterm elections. For now, members of NAG will keep sharpening their shooting skills and standing up for what they see as an essential civil right. One of the things that's always affected me personally is uh, that I've had people say, hey, you, you're a person of color, you shouldn't have guns, right? Because you can be a target, it's dangerous. My answer to that is that I should have the right to have a gun like anybody else because I'm not a second class American, I'm an American. So I think that the point I'm trying to draw, drive home right now, what I'm really trying to project here, for the sake of the Bundist movement and the Jewish people having the wisdom to choose the Bundist movement as Zionism decreases in popularity, you, need, you now even see that Jewish reform is, re is returning completely to its anti-Zionist roots. And you have a lot of Jewish people, you know, wondering, well, what do we have in order for us to maintain our own protection and autonomy? And if Zionism doesn't represent us, what does? And the answer would be, you could be a Bundist. And we can't exactly claim to represent all the Jewish people. But I would say we do have the growing tendency to feel pressured to represent all the non-ultra-Orthodox. And no, we won't represent Jews for Jesus because Jews for Jesus is not Jewish. And Chabad is not Jewish. So yes, the ultra orthodox is Jewish. We can't speak for the ultra orthodox. In fact, we have to determine who the leaders of our generation are. We've already said it's Natria Carta. But if you're modern orthodox and you want to get rid of the Zionists, that's where you should come to the boon. If you're reform, reconstructionist, or conservative and you hate Zionism, you should come to the boon. So understand that it's never over. Never say that this is the end for you. And be a partisan. Do not be a pacifist.